So we've been going on through this series where we're trying to get to know Jesus a little bit better. Through our series, we've kind of taken time to reflect upon Jesus' interaction, not only with his own family, interactions that he's had with disciples, interactions that he's had with even people who were opposing him. The religious leaders were mainly the ones that had the opposition and, and those moments where they were constantly in conflict with him. But I want to take today um, a, a very unique Sunday and say as we're slowly walking our way to Easter sometimes as we talk about the kingdom of God and when we talk about it it, it becomes very foggy it becomes very um, confusing and I say that for many many different reasons as as uh, disciples of Jesus sometimes those who have been entrusted to to teach us or to train us or to guide us in our spiritual walk and our understanding of Christ and his kingdom uh, about the Father and the Holy Spirit's role. Um, unfortunately, there are those out there who either, one, haven't taken the time to really study and understand, to look into not only church history, but church tradition, to look into uh, many, 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 many centuries of scholarly work of people trying to understand more and more how Jesus functioned on this earth, how the Holy Spirit plays a role in our everyday life, and then how the Father is the one who has orchestrated this all and trying to reveal himself through all of these moments, not only in scripture, but even in the moments that we find ourselves day in and day out. There's that possibility that maybe they just didn't, you know, do their homework, if you will. And as a result, we end up having these concepts that sometimes don't really align with one another. And that's the reason why, as we're taking this journey um, uh, and for those who have joined us or have, have maybe missed out, this is this is the the place that we find ourselves as we're asking the question, Jesus, how you know how do we interact with you? Who are you to begin with? Right, that's the biggest picture, Jesus. Who are you? Um, are you made in my image or am I made in yours? And if I'm made in your image, then what image is that? Like what behaviors, Jesus, am I to expect from you? What kind of love am I to expect from you? What kind of, uh, are you going to be direct? Are you going to be mean? Are you going to be kind? Are you going to be loving all the time? It, you know, it's, it's really very important to ask those questions. And we also have to understand the theological concepts that are related to it as well. Jesus being fully God, what does that mean? Jesus being uh, the one from the beginning and the, the, the end, which is why in Revelation he describes himself as, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm, I'm the one who started this all. And I am the one who is going to bring all of this to an end um, and, and in essence a new beginning. So we have to ask the question, Jesus, then who are you? And, and as we ask that, we dive further into Scripture. We dive further into those who either one-on-one -on -one spent time with Him, or they had the access to people or resources or stories of those who spent one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. One of those specific ones that we're looking at is the one and only youngest disciple and according to him himself as he describes himself in his own gospel the one that jesus loved and we're looking at john as we're venturing through john we're taking our time to understand john help us get ready for easter help us uh, in this time where we are focusing on repentance and letting our our own lives kind of be laid down for the purposes that they could be brought back up but not by our hands but by the resurrected christ that we could live new lives. So often when we think of the kingdom, the kingdom is one of those where we say, I don't, I don't really know how to describe it. I don't know how, what it is, really. <laughs> and that's a lack of discipleship. It really, um, whether it's, it, you know, we haven't really taken the time to study and to understand God's kingdom even more, to dive into Jesus' parables or what he taught us, uh, or even Paul's theology of the kingdom. Or maybe we just weren't taught rightly, if that would make sense. So I want to take the time right now to guide you through a conversation where somebody actually came to Jesus, not for the purpose necessarily talking about the kingdom, but rather he intended to kind of um, 
you know, kind of give Jesus the, the litmus test of, of, of like, let's, let's see, who, you know, who you are. Some are saying that you're the Messiah. Some are saying that you're just a prophet. Some are saying that you're just a teacher. If anything offends Jesus more, it's when he's just called a teacher. But it's okay. That's something that we're going to have to deal with in our story. If you guys have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John chapter 3. And I know what you're probably thinking. You're like, oh, John 3.16. Everyone always quotes that. And the reason why, it's actually one of the most well-known and memorized verses of Scripture. Um, but we have to understand it within its context. Otherwise, John 3.16 just looks like a really cool idea, like a very hopeful idea. Uh, and it is, but at the same time, there's John 3.17. And there's also John 3.15 that will help us understand John 3.16 and why it's there. So we start off our story with an amazing Pharisee. Of all the people, it's a religious leader. And normally Jesus has a lot of problem with these guys. But this guy's a little different. And we'll find out why. So turning your Bibles to John 3, um, starting with verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi... We know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he, they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, and the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You cannot be surprised at my saying. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you out of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now I stop right there before we get to John 3.16. And there's a reason we'll get there. Okay? Here's what's very interesting about the story. We begin with Nicodemus, right? Interesting name. The guy's name is Nicodemus, right? Which it, when we break down what that means, it means victory over people. Interesting. Maybe his name was given that way because he, in this story, is actually buttering up Jesus. Now, I'm very thankful that we never do that, right? When it comes to prayer, let's be honest and real. Yes, sometimes we tell Jesus, you're wonderful, you're beautiful, you're amazing, you're awesome. Now, can I have a cherry red Ferrari? <laughs> now, you may be thinking, I don't ask Jesus for that. I know, but sometimes we give him very strong suggestions of what kind of outcomes we want in prayer. And we think that we'll get our way if we butter him up. Well, Jesus sees past our little games. In this case, Nicodemus walks to Jesus. And it's very interesting when. According to John, it says that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Why at night? Well, there are two things that John may mean by that. One of them is there's a chance that Nicodemus came to him at night because he doesn't want the other religious leaders to know that he's having a conversation with the one that's causing so much ruckus. So it's kind of the, I'll meet you at midnight, so that way nobody knows that we're talking. But there's also something interesting. In John, the concept darkness is a very, very, very much used concept that John presents. Darkness is where bad things happen. Darkness is where sin is hidden. Darkness is, well, darkness. Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's evil. So for John, the fact that there's a Pharisee that is coming to Jesus in darkness, why? Because he's hiding. But what does he come to Jesus for? It's interesting. His words, again, are just buttering him up. He says to Jesus, um, Rabbi, let's start there. He called him teacher. That's kind of one of the most offensive things that you could do to Jesus. 
read the gospels. Whenever someone calls Jesus rabbi, oh, it's like that super uncomfortable, like you're giving me this title out of respect, but you really don't respect me. It just means teacher. We know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. What, what is Nicodemus' goal? Right now, his goal is to size Jesus up. Chances are, because he said, we feel that you are sent from God, is that he's in a, in a very covert way saying, I'm not the only one asking this question. There are m- some more of my you know, background over here, the, the, the Pharisees and, and rulers. But he's, he's kind of hinting at the fact of, we're trying to figure out who you are, Jesus. What, what's your deal? There are some of you who have never, ever gone to church before. Somebody sent you this video and they want you to watch it because they want you to come to church. They want you to come uh, to uh, an understanding of who Jesus is and to give your life to Jesus. Can I tell you something? What Nicodemus is doing is what very often people who don't believe in Jesus yet like to do with Jesus. They like to, in essence, put him under a microscope and go, what are you all about? What's your real goal here? What is your real deal, Jesus? Because I'll be honest, we look at Christians and they're just a bunch of hypocrites. So why would I want to give myself to a guy whose, you know, followers are just a bunch of dummies, really? (laughs) Nicodemus is trying to do the same thing. He's trying to look at Jesus going, are you the real deal? Are you the one we're waiting for? Or can I prove that you're something else? Here's the secret. What I love about Jesus, one, there's no question asked yet. Nicodemus hasn't asked a question. But Jesus automatically ignores any part of this conversation. Doesn't even say, thank you for giving me the the credit of, you know, being from God. No, in fact, what I love what Jesus does, he will always deal and always act upon the real issue in the moment. In this case, that's what we're about to find out. He immediately looks at, at Nicodemus bypasses whatever agenda Nicodemus may or may not have. And he says, truly, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Two things that are just said that are confusing. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. The Greek word for born again could mean born from the top, born from above, born from the beginning, or born again. You can understand why this would be a very confusing statement, especially to this religious leader. He's hearing Jesus, but he's going, wait, no one can understand the kingdom of God. No one can see it unless they are born again. I would be confused too, because I would go, what What do you mean by that? It's not only that, understand, there's a lot of confusion right here. Why? Because Nicodemus was just saying, hey, we think that you're from God. And Jesus immediately goes into the real issue. The real issue is, Nicodemus, is that if you're interested in coming to me to find out what the kingdom of God is like, if you actually want to see it, one word, see. What's interesting is Jesus is offering something. He's saying, if you are interested in seeing the kingdom of God, no. It is not a matter of perceiving. It's not a matter of, I just want to see God, his glory, angels, where he rules, where he reigns. I want to see heaven. That's that's not what Jesus is saying. The word for see means an active participation in. What Jesus is offering Nicodemus in conversation right then and there is, if you really came to me and you want to talk about heavenly things, there's a problem. You can't even actively involve yourself into the kingdom unless one very important thing happens and that you are born again. Nicodemus's confusion obviously comes about. Why? Because he brings up the subject. How can someone be born when they are old? Now, I mean, that's a legitimate question. You're, you're, you said the phrase born again. I'm, I, I know I've been born once, that's for sure. But he has, you know, how how's I can't wrap my head around the fact that you just... So he says, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Now he's asking, listen, I, I, chances are he's an older gentleman. And as an older gentleman, he's saying, I, I don't, I'm, if that's the case, like if that's really required, physically that's impossible. The word born again can be born from on top, born from the beginning, born from above, or born again. 
Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you. By the way, notice that Jesus doesn't say, according to the law. No, he's constantly telling um, Nicodemus, listen, I am the one telling you this. I am the authority. I am the top authority. That is why you, when you read, truly, truly, I say to you, what Jesus is declaring is, I am above the law. I am above that authority. I'm telling you something. I'm not leaning on some old text. I am leaning on myself. Why? Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the ultimate authority on this earth and in the heavens and everywhere else. So he looks at him and goes, truly, truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Now let's open up this theological bomb that's about to go off. There are so many things that it could mean. So many centuries of, of, of scholars that have fought, literally argued over what does this mean, especially those of the Baptist background. Aha! Uh -huh. it, it says it right there. Jesus said, you cannot enter the kingdom of, of heaven unless you are born of water and of spirit. Boom! Water baptism right there. Like, it's very clear. No, it's not. If anything, you are way off base to say that water baptism has to do with salvation. I know I'm upsetting some people right now, but the reason why I'm being very clear and very direct is because if this isn't the meaning that John, the, the, the you know, disciple and apostle is writing, then you cannot run into the future, into some denomination, and then lay upon this text what that centuries later denomination decides is an important aspect of salvation. The Baptist movement felt that baptism, because it was constantly seen in the book of Acts with salvation, that they said, well, baptism is part of salvation, period. And then they overlaid it onto the gospel text. Can't do that. If anything, that's called eisegesis, meaning you are now putting your ideas into the Bible. Exegesis is letting the Bible tell you its own ideas. So no, this doesn't have anything to do with water baptism. What if it has to do with John the Baptist's baptism? Oh my gosh, no, not that either. <laughs> what if it has to do with, um, there's so many different options. Can I tell you something? If we can uh, turn on our, our scientific brains for a second, everyone knew at that time that when you are born, there is a bunch of water that is expelled from mama which tells her it is now time to give birth. That water has to do with the fact that now she is ready to give birth. It's the breaking of the water. One second, you must be born of water and of spirit, meaning you have to, one, be born once, but then you also have to be born from above. The spirit of God is the one that has to give birth to you. This is a concept that now Jesus is getting at. He's saying, look, if you, Nicodemus, are going to understand anything from me, I need you to understand this. You need to be, one, born physically, and two, then you also need the Spirit to give you life so that you can participate in the kingdom of God. You cannot be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus is now displaying to him, listen, you can't control the spirit and him giving birth, bringing new life to whoever he wants. The religious leaders had certain, you know, regulations and expectations. God would give birth to, well, people that had their ducks in a row. Not to the people that aren't listening or not following Torah. They're, or people that had physical ailments or mental disabilities. Like, oh, they, they are definitely not loved of God and they're on the outside. They're not even allowed in temple. Jesus was saying, look at, the, look at the wind. You see the wind? Yeah. You can see that it's doing something active. Where did it come from? No one knows. Where is it going? Nobody knows that either. You can see that it's happening, but you can't control it. What Jesus was telling Nicodemus is, listen, the Spirit of God is coming with a new awakening, with a new life, with a new breath, with a new beginning, if you will. He is recreating creation. And you, you can see it happening. But you can't always decide when, where, how, or why. Finally, Nicodemus changes the questions. Instead of, 
how is that even physically possible to be born from your mama again? Now he's moved on to how, how does, how does, how exactly does this happen? I want to know, how does one jump into the kingdom? Jesus said, you are Israel's teacher. In other words, you are the one that is studying Torah. You are the one that is spending time with God. You're the expert on God. And yet I can't tell you the things of heaven because you have no understanding of them. Is that correct? Is that what I'm getting at? Could you imagine sitting in the doctor's office and you have to explain to your doctor what's wrong with you and then give them the diagnosis of what's wrong with you? And he's sitting there going, well, I don't really. You would get out of that room and go to another doctor immediately, wouldn't you? That's Jesus' point. He's looking at Nicodemus saying, you're the religious leader and you have no idea what you're. Wow. Jesus said, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you people still do not accept our testimony. Now he's getting to the fact of, why are you asking? You are interested in the kingdom and you want to learn from me about the kingdom, yet you won't believe me when I tell you about the kingdom. I have spoken to you on earthly things and you do not believe them. Do you know what he means by that? Is he talking about heaven? Yes, but he's talking about what is it like when the Spirit of God interacts with earth? What does it look like here? What, what does kingdom life look like here? It means that the Holy Spirit makes you aware of the fact that there is a kingdom and invites you not to just watch things, to actively participate in them. Be the kingdom, if you will. Wow. That's how it works here. So what Jesus is doing is doing this rabbinic kind of argument. We're starting with the lesser, and then we'll eventually get to the greater. But he's saying, I can't even get to the greater. We're stuck here, bro. Like, how? how? I'm trying to explain to you how things function here. I, I don't know. If you're not getting the concept now, how am I going to tell you about how things function there? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. I love that word. Jesus doesn't call himself the Son of God. He calls himself the Son of Man. Why? Because Son of God and Messiah were loaded with this, you know, sword in hand kind of, uh, of, of imagery that the Messiah would be someone who would stab everyone and take over and God is in control. But you use the word Son of Man and now you're going to, to Daniel and Ezekiel and, and, and the prophets that said that, 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 the, that God was with God and, 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 and that the, the Son of Man approached the Ancient of Days. And he's a servant and he suffers and yet he's a king. See, Jesus was... He didn't want mislabeling. He wanted to label himself correctly. So he said, I'm going to choose this phrase, son of man, which we could translate to mean Superman. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now he's trying to invite Nicodemus to a reality of the kingdom. Nicodemus, listen. In the book of Exodus, there is a moment where snakes were constantly attacking Israel. As a result, uh, Moses ends up taking one of the snakes, kills it, wraps it around a staff. And in those who were inflicted because of the snake bites, Moses ends up lifting the snake up. And this snake that is wrapped around this, this you know, stick or whatever, he says, if anyone looks upon this image, that they would find healing. And they did. It was a miracle that God performed. You know what's funny? I want you to think of any ambulance that you've ever seen drive by. If you ever notice that the medical symbol is a staff with a snake wrapped around it, that whoever looks at this image would find healing. Interesting. Not only is this found in Exodus, the purpose, that the reason why Jesus brings this up is because Jesus would be lifted up as well. But whenever the, the um, sorry, the Gospels reference Jesus being lifted up, it's not just an exaltation. It's always a reference to the cross. Why? Because Jesus would be stapled to the cross, as we will see in Easter. But then as he was lifted Anyone who looked upon him would have, this is where things get weird. Eternal life? 
That's our, whoa, I almost fell. That's our English translation. Life eternal is getting a little closer to the concept. And it, why? Because we think of eternal life, in other words, I get to live forever. Don't think of it as living forever because everyone gets to live forever, either forever in hell or forever with God. Think of it this way. What could I do here? And this goes into a bigger theological concept. God is interested in bringing heaven to earth again. He had it at the beginning in the garden. And as we will see in the book of Revelation, heaven and earth will meet once more. Hell and and, and, and Satan and his sin and his kingdom will be eradicated and removed so that earth and heaven can come together again. Heaven come to earth. What is it like for me to live heavenly here on earth? How do I live eternally here on earth? Now are you getting the picture? The majority of scholars believe that the following verses are not something Jesus said. And it would make sense because it doesn't really uh, make a whole lot of sense when you read it all the way through. John has the tendency of presenting massive theological truth. And then it's always followed by a a little bit of his own discourse. In other words, he'll say, sit down. Now that you've heard the story, let me give you a little extra so that you can take this home. What does he say? These are now John's words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict, and this is what I want you guys to pay attention to. Light is coming to the world. There's that concept, light. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. John ends his story. Where Jesus is trying to get this religious leader who is interested in getting into the kingdom of God. And what I love is that he's offering the kingdom to him. He's giving him the keys. And he's saying, listen, I'm giving you the keys. I'm telling you where the door is. I'm giving it all to you. However, Nicodemus, it is now your choice. The keys are in your hand. But it's your decision to turn the key and open the door. And by opening the door, I mean that you are choosing to see, a.k.a. participate in the kingdom of God today. How does he do that? Because eventually, Nicodemus is going to have to look at the Son of Man who was raised, lifted up on that cross. And then everything is open and makes sense. John gives us this little discourse and says, listen. Before you make the conclusion that Jesus has come to the earth to look at everyone and look at their sins and say, ha ha, I caught you all. No. And he's not doing that with Nicodemus either. In fact, he's doing something beautiful with Nicodemus. And it looks like this. And what's interesting is if we were to take the exact Greek phrase and translate it directly into the English. This is what John 3.16 sounds like. For God, Theos, the one and only. God of the universe. For God so loved agape. There are different levels of, of love in the Greek, okay? There's love of brother and sister. There's love for, for wife uh, or husband. That's very intimate. Um, and there's also a, a family kind of love. But then there's this thing called agape love, which means perfect love. And it's specifically divine. And the reason why I call it divine is because agape love is I am, I am choosing to love the person who is being loved 100%. Their behavior doesn't diminish or raise my love for them. It is a love that stays at 100% regardless of your actions or your decisions. It's a divine love. It's God's love. 
So let's start again. For God, theos, so agape, the cosmos. The word cosmos is a very disgusting word. It means world, but it, there's many other words that John could have used, but he uses the word cosmos because cosmos is kind of the, the ugly way of saying world. It's the yucky, gross, covered in snot, like dung on fire, dumpster on fire, if you want to put it that way, whatever. It's the, uh, uh. but that's the contrast. For God, Theos, the creator of the universe, so agape the that he gave it's a free gift his one and only son unique beautiful the greatest gift that God could ever give in his acts of grace to give his only son that whoever trusts the word is to trust you can't trust a thing by the way you can only trust a person Jesus is a person can only trust whosoever by the way that's everyone everyone <laughs> that's including you and me that whosoever believes trust in him will not ever be washed away the word for perish is an allusion to the days of noah when god was just broken hearted over his humanity and how they were starting to kill each other and destroy each other, control each other. So he said, enough, I can't do this. You guys will destroy the very thing and all the things that I've created. So he flooded the earth, but he left Noah alive. He said, listen, if you trust in the son of man, this, this washing away, this perishing, this no more, but instead you will have life that comes from above. You will learn how to live as if heaven was here in your room, in your house, in your city, in your workplace, in your life, in your family, in your day to day, in your breathing and everything. In verse 16, because Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save it. But the world loves darkness. There's that phrase, the darkness. Why? Because we love our sin. We love uh, the hiding. We love the, the, the secrecy. We love this sense of we have control and God doesn't have control. You can look at our society today and there's so many things that humanity has taken into its own hands and ma manipulated and, and changed and lied about and, and the lies and the lies and the lies don't stop. And here God is saying, I'm not here to get on your case. I am here to remove the lies so that truth can finally come by, which is why it says light has come into the world. Darkness, we, we love to hide. We love to pretend like we're okay and we're not okay. And we're so scared. Why? Because when light comes, now everything, well, when light comes, you can't lie anymore because now we can see it all. But if that's true, then that means that when Jesus came, and if the, the connection is with Nicodemus, that means that Jesus came so that you and I could understand the truth of who we actually are by understanding the truth of who God actually is, that he came to rescue us. He came to rescue you. He came to rescue me, a broken, very much selfish man. I don't know about you, but that sounds like really good news. And before you make the decision that, well, Jesus is just here to control my life and for people at church to control my life and stop. If that's what you think is going on, then you've completely missed this conversation. You've completely missed John's extra conversation. For Jesus did not come to condemn the world. He didn't come to bring it into chains. He came to set it free. He came to help you and I understand our need for him. That without him, our lives will have been wasted and wasted away. Like, like falling into an ocean that rises and rises and there's no hope for us. And what ends up happening? We just drown and we just disappear. 
that whoever believes and trusts in Jesus would never ever be washed away. But instead, we will finally receive what we were intended for, and that is to have heaven and earth together again. We, we, you and I, are where heaven and earth meet. And it started with the ultimate heaven and earth meeting, and that is Jesus, fully God and fully man. I'm telling you, John chapter 3 is insane. But I have this offer to give you. Do you just want to see it? Or do you want to be a part of it? That's where this started. This is where the conversation started with Jesus. He looked at Nicodemus and he said, No one can see. In other words, no one can actively participate in the kingdom unless they are born of water and of spirit. Did you know that if you have a desire right now to have a relationship with God, you didn't start that? In fact, according to theology, according to your Bible, no one, no one starts that. More specifically, if you read John's letters later on in the Bible, it says, He loved us before we loved Him. Which means that your desire to want to give your heart to Jesus right now, that's not yours. That's his. He's putting that desire in you. The spirit of God is breathing life into you. Isn't that awesome? I want to encourage you to make that decision today. If you haven't received Jesus as your savior, if you haven't made the decision, please. It's not a fancy prayer. It's it's not say these words and you're saved. No, it's, it's, it's just sit there and be honest. Start the conversation. Dear God, Jesus, whoever I'm talking to, with time, you'll, te- you'll teach me how to talk to you. But I'm here to tell you, I'm, I give up. I'm done. Please, be the Lord of my life. And be the one who guides me. Be the one that puts my training wheels back on. Be the one who gives me new beginnings. But there's also some of you, renegades if you want to call them that. (laughs) There are some of you who, man, you walked away. I don't know, maybe life got too hard or maybe something happened. Maybe church was too churchy for you and maybe somebody made mistakes. Or maybe you felt like Jesus failed you. But right now there's that part of you that says, but I really, really want to get back. I really just want God again. That feeling isn't yours. That's his. He's putting that feeling in you. I would highly encourage you to come back. In the words of a a little old lady that once talked to me, Maybe it's time you come home. I love you all. Grace and peace be with you. Have a great Sunday.